Hello dear viewers, so this is George from Ireland picking up where I left off, if I can get the camera to stay still. Um, so 1988, I talked about Michael Stone uh, attacking um, uh, the funeral in Milltown Cemetery of three IRA members. So he was uh, hailed as a hero by uh, loyalists because um, he'd atta attacked on his own. Anyway, um, so some of the people who he killed were buried a few days later and um, two uh, off-duty British Army sergeants were driving around in plain clothes, but they were uh, people around the falls noticed this car is not from around here. Who are they? A huge angry crowd surrounded their car. So the sergeants got worried. They pulled out their um, handguns and they were threatening to people, let us through because a car was blocking their crowd. They could have driven through the crowd, injured, maybe even killed people and got it away safely, but they didn't do that. Had they done that, of course, Republicans say, oh, it's terrible, they injured uh, people who didn't mean them, them any harm. Um, but anyway, um, the uh, sergeants fired into the ground warning shots to get people to back off. Uh, and Cleeky Clark, an IRA man, said, don't be firing. Well, anyway, the uh, sergeants were overwhelmed, dragged out of the car, and um, they were killed with their own guns. So I spoke to a para about it, said they should have used it. So Father Alec Reed performed the last rites in them. He was a priest from the south who served in that area for a long time. He was very close to his flock. But as Adams later said, that uh, Father Reed could see the goodness in anybody, whether it's a police officer, um, whether it was a, a soldier, whether it's a member of the IRA. Anyway, um, so that was that. The Loyalist terrorists were not killing large numbers of people, just the occasional um, person, usually simply because this person was Catholic. Incidentally, they seem to have only targeted men. They very rarely killed a woman. She'd have to be certain in the Republican, woman, uh, Republican movement to deliberately kill her. Later in the 90s, they were not quite so scrupulous about that. Some loose ends I should have tied up. Um, I mentioned, um, who was it, uh, Robert McCartney, a unionist politician, later became a member of parliament for North Down. And he's one of very few unionist politicians not to have been in any of the loyal orders the Orange Order, the Apprentice Boys, and so forth. So almost all of them otherwise were. So I thought I should point out what those are. Now, the Orange Order is the principal one, and um, its origins are debatable. But uh, the most common story is that were founded, it was founded in 1795 at Loch Gaul, um, in Dan Winter's cottage. There was a Catholic um, paramilitary organisation, the Defenders, and then there was the Orange Boys, and they clashed there um, um, and at Dolly's Bray. So I won't go into it, but um, it was about agricultural issues, who was allowed to be tenant here and things like that, and just sectarianism. But um, the Orange Order was open to communicants of the Church of Ireland only to begin with. Only later did they permit um, other Protestants to join, such as Baptists, Methodists and the like. And uh, they opposed the Act of Union in, um, in uh, 1800, which the Orange Order today doesn't emphasize. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, what was I going to say? They meet in the summer, they have their marching season, the run-up to the 12th of July, commemorating the Battle of the Boyne. They have Orange Lodges, that's their clubhouse. Northern Ireland is divided into several districts for the purpose of the Orange Order. Each district has several lodges. And uh, the Orange Order exists around the world, but um, they have one march in the Republic of Ireland, Rosnola, in Donegal every summer. And there hasn't been an Orange March in, in Dublin as a regular thing since uh, about 1935. And in Scotland, it's there a bit. In England, a very little. And then abroad, like Canada, Australia, or Togo, or Ghana, a tiny bit. So that's that. This is a religious and political organisation, and they swear loyalty to the British monarchy, so long as that monarchy remains Protestant, because, of course, they could become Catholics again. Um, and that's that. And they're generally, I suppose, small-c conservatives. They function a bit like a trades union in the early days of a friendly society, paying in, helping each other out, and their charity was themselves, really. And they do do other charity work. Um, so uh, they were certainly pro-Protestant. Many people regard them as being anti-Catholic as well. I mean, I've met members of the Orange Order, and one of them who turned against it said, oh, well, we used to hear that Catholics prayed to funny things and things like that. Obviously, they're junior Orangemen as well, so it could function as a youth club. People could join at their teens, stay all their life. Um, it had cross-class appeal. In recent decades, not like that. I mean, there are no upper-class members, not many middle-class members either. But in the old days, it was different. It briefly been banned in the early 19th century. The confusing thing is there are several 
organizations with the word orange in the name in the late 18th century, and the lineage is not quite clear. Um, so there's an argument that was founded in Tyrone uh, slightly earlier by somebody else, by James Wilson. But uh, there we are. Um, what else about the Orange Order? Well, Dr. Bernardo famously was a member of it. So uh, most Catholics in Northern Ireland have a low opinion of the Orange Order. Some of them revile it. So its, it's um, marches were contentious, uh, to say the least. They voluntarily rerouted some of these. Uh, sometimes they refused to. They felt they made enough concessions and want to go through. They often furiously denounce uh, Republican terrorism. However, loyalist terrorists seem to have had little difficulty obtaining membership, not just people who are in the UVF, but um, those who are actually convicted of terrorist crimes, including one of the Shankill butchers, which is really disgraceful. So there was often trouble around these orange marches, often attacking IUC officers. So you mustn't claim that the IUC was therefore in cahoots with the Orange Order or the Loyalist terrorist organizations when they were battling them on the street. But um, often it was um, hooligans who would hang around rather than Orangemen themselves, themselves who were doing this sort of things. Now, occasionally, um, weapons possessed by loyalist terrorist organizations were hidden in orange lodges and so on. They're the Apprentice Boys, and that's another loyal order. Uh, there can be overlapping membership. Someone can only join the Apprentice Boys within the walls of Derry, and they're commemorating the siege of 1688 to 89 because of the 13 teenagers who slammed the gates in the face of King James II's troops. Of course, loyalists don't like to remember this, but the Apprentice Boys were the rebels, the people of Derry were the rebels because James II was the undoubted sovereign in 1688. This is before the revolution of that November when they slammed the gates. Nobody disputed that he was uh, the rightful monarch. So they're going against um, rightful authority. So there's a strain in loyalism of contractual kingship. I suppose they, they look back to the Covenanters in 17th century Scotland, that they will be loyal to the monarch only on certain conditions. that The monarch upholds their liberties and one of those would be, I suppose, their right to march or Protestantism and so on. Um, now, having said that, none of them seem to say that Catholicism should be outlawed and there are plenty of Catholic churches. And um, in the early 70s, there were some attacks on Catholic churches, very rarely after that. So um, uh, orange marches weren't so controversial till the 70s. And loyalists often say, well, Catholics came out to watch us and so on. But... Um, it's, it's meant to be a religious organisation, but some of some people's behaviour is not very uh, seemly and there can be heavy drinking going on. And there are some people who are more respectable and refined. There's some temperance lodges um, because the lodges have a number and a name to go with them. So in some lodges, people don't drink at all. In other lodges, they're not against consuming alcohol, but they are against getting drunk and so forth. So people join it because they wanted to or they believed in this ideology. Also, it helped them get ahead in life. Um, help them get jobs. And in the early 20s, when jobs were scarce, Orange membership went up considerably because they thought it was going to redound to their advantage. Only 2% of IUC officers in the Troubles were members of the Orange Order. So despite Republicans trying to say, oh, the IUC are totally pro-Orange, that's, um, that's not the case. But um, there were some people with uh, revolting sectarian attitudes in the Orange Order, and they're using various anti-Catholic epithets, calling Catholics Fenians, when going to the proper meaning of Fenian, often Fenian accompanied by a swear word. RC would be turned into rat catcher, um, papist. Well, it's not actually an insult, but it's um, certainly controversial. Catholics don't call ourselves that. And then, um, uh, I can't think, things like that. There was some anti-Protestant uh, attitude amongst Republicans. Um, prod doesn't have to be opprobrious. Protestants would often call themselves that. The other one is orangey, even if a person's not a member of the Orange Order. If you go back to um, the 60s, almost 50% of um, Protestant men were members of one of the Loyal Orders. Now, the upper middle class, usually not. The um, people who are long, who are often unemployed, seasonal labourers, the unskilled labourers, usually not because they couldn't afford to, because they had to pay a membership fee and buy, have a suit and an orange sash. Um, but these days, it, it's only about 10% of Protestant men are there. So they're having difficulty reaching out to the youth. There's the Royal Purple Arch and the Royal Black Preceptory, other loyal orders. Um, anything else I should have pointed out? Oh, well, I was going to mention Willie McRae, who's a DUP a politician, MP for Mid-Ulster, and uh, liked singing a lot. But um, And he would always remind his, uh, remind his uh, congregants that uh, the IRA were Roman Catholics. Now, it's true that almost all of them were Catholics, but it seemed to be he was pushing anti-Catholicism when he rammed home that point. Um, so that was that. Anyway, all through the 80s, 
Jim Molyneux was leader of um, the uh, uh, Ulster Unionist Party MP for where was it um, Lagan Valley so um, not very very effectual had little appeal and um, he certainly didn't have the stage presence that Paisley did and he didn't have that booming voice and didn't do such good uh, fire and brimstone oratory an effectual manner a man of you know manager of the shop kind of bland maybe he personified the flinty and ultra-conservative nature of uh, Ulster Unionism.